The Todd Shapiro Show. Time to hit the button. On Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167. Okay. Our man, uh, yeah, Lance Lambert, at 805 Lance from BovadaInc.com. What's up, brah? Hey, what is happening? How you doing, Todd? Man, I'm good. Everything's real good. There was a, it was sort of like uh, out here in Toronto, uh, where I am broadcasting from to the rest of the world. It was it was sort of like they were calling it a, very, a big revolutionary day. Is for the first time ever, a privatized cannabis store opened up uh, right here on Queen Street, one of our big streets. Did you hear about that? I did, and I'm definitely familiar with Queen Street. Stayed right over by there last time I was up. Yeah, today is a big day for specifically Ontario uh, and brick-and-mortar cannabis shops uh, opening today. So I know it's the first day for Ontario um, to allow the legal brick-and-mortar cannabis shops uh, to open up. But I do know as of right now, it's kind of unknown on how many of these shops were actually ready to do business as of today. So uh, it's good to hear at least one of them's open <laughs> and doing business. Um, curious to hear how many kick off over the next couple of days and start uh, being able to offer product as well. But that's definitely it's, it's big news for you guys. Yeah, you're right. It was it was real big news. And and the other thing that was really interesting, and, and I find this interesting still, and I wonder why. And maybe you can help answer it. Um, the I I've just never waited in line for anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, it's almost as if people had never had pot before, but there were lineups at like six in the morning for this things and, and lineups all day to get in around the corner. Is it, is there just a big community support here? Is that part of the reason, Lance? I think it is. You know, it's, again, we've talked about some similarities between your market and uh, those in the States, and it's very reminiscent of uh, Colorado. I was there, of course, when uh, adult use first legalized January 1st of 2014, We have the same thing where, obviously, to your point, a lot of people that consume have had sources in the past, um, albeit gray market, black market, whatever it was, but obviously they are able to access uh, cannabis prior to the date of legalization. So it is believed that a lot of it is uh, showing support and to be able to say you were the first in line on the first day they're legalized. I mean, that's definitely something I see no matter what country you're from. Uh, being a great story to tell your grandkids when they go, wait, this was illegal? (laughs) Because that's inevitably going to happen for you and I both in our lifetime, where this is going to be such the norm, similar to uh, to where alcohol came compared to where it was, uh, that uh, I think it's going to be a great story for a lot of people to tell. I think so, too. Actually, you're a friend of yours that you introduced me to. And and to be honest, I actually forget his name right off the top of my head, but Wheatstagram uh, um, was there. What's his name? Jonathan, yeah. Jonathan, and he was wearing a Bovida hat, I saw. <laughs> he is definitely, he's a huge advocate of ours, wonderful influencer. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, in Canada, they're called educators. Um, he is a wonderful educator in the industry, and he always does a good job of that, being uh, right in the limelight, the front line of things. So that's awesome to hear. Yeah, that's, uh, well, I mean, really neat that, uh, you know, people who have been advocates for so long and, and educators, as you say, get get involved. And, you know, I think that's really important. So, um, and, and uh, how are things evolving in the United States of America? Any sort of updated news since last week? Yeah, well, you know, things kind of went south for us in New Jersey. Not too big of a surprise. They're kind of going hot and heavy as far as uh, legalization goes after the uh, swapping of governors uh, that were running that state. But unfortunately, lost a bit of steam and weren't able to uh, get enough participation to move forward. But on the other side, um, in many in the East Coast call them the bridge and tunnel crowd, going on the other side of the bridge and tunnel is New York and uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, who is uh, obviously pro-cannabis, I think from um, from a monetary, from a financial gain standpoint, but politically he knows it makes sense as well. Um, he insisted today that New York will pass a law to legalize recreational or adult use cannabis, as we call it, before legislation occurs, or I'm sorry, before legislature adjourns in June. So uh, that's some promising news. I mean, New York, as far as by populace, has the highest per capita of cannabis consumers, um, albeit the second largest populated state to uh, to California. But that's going to be a big, big move uh, for the East Coast as far as getting New York on board with an adult use program. And and I, I believe we talked about it briefly, but the uh, the banking on the cannabis industry that their lenders can now get involved, and that and that was passed. What what is that? You know how how important will that be? 
That's huge. So that is something, yeah, definitely going into the financial side of things. Uh, that's been a hot topic because uh, that has been a challenge. You know, a lot of people have unfortunately had uh, some tough situations and not just those touching the plant, as we say, but also some ancillary companies uh, in the industry with what to do from a financial standpoint. There's a lot of banks that once they find out and there's certain tiers of touch points, so tier one being that, that you are in the industry, you have plants, you, you produce, you distribute, whatever the case may be. Tier two would be someone uh, like ourselves who work with those people and tier three would say uh, be a media company. So all these different tiers, um, everyone in each tier at some point or another has been affected with something to do with banking when it comes to collecting monies that are tied to the industry. So that's really what the uh, the Safe Banking Act is trying to do. And um, it did move forward uh, as far as the next steps uh, over in D.C. And we're hoping to see something come into fruition this year because a lot of people do lose sleep over uh, how to transport all this money, where to store all this money. Uh, all the rest of it. So the fact that it's legal in so many states, uh, but yet there isn't a true uh, banking system to support it at the federal level has been a challenge for, for quite honestly years now. Is cannabis still a very hot topic just for kind of everyday life dinner tables? Like, or is it something that, especially being in Southern California, eh, everyone's used to it by now, or, or, you know, are people still getting, you know, really, really making a part of their daily conversations? Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. And in many ways, we always compare uh, California to uh, to Canada and specifically yep. Ontario. You know, California is, there. There are there is a predominant amount of Republicans here, but it's very much known for being a more liberal and democratic state uh, at large. And with that, it, it has kind of been normalized. You know, again, we've talked about Prop P back in 1990 in San Francisco and then uh, Prop 215, which came about in 1996, which was our, our medical cannabis program. It's been around so long, and it's, it's been a part of uh, just daily life, to your point, that even when the adult use or Prop 64, as it's called, came into fruition, a lot of people are like, okay, so what does that even mean? We still have access to cannabis. It's like, well, yeah, but now you don't need uh, you know, a medical or what people call a, a recommendation in order to make the purchase. So California is a little bit of an exception to the rule, but I'd say at large nationally, uh, it still gets a bit of exposure uh, from the larger news outlets like USA Today, New York Times, Wash Post, NBC, CBS, et cetera. Uh, but it kind of goes in ebbs and flows. And any more in recent months, it seems like the focus has been a bit more on the financial side. So to your point, not just what to do with all that money, but um, investments, stocks, et cetera. So, uh, but it's quieted down, I'd say. Right now is a little bit of a lull. Um, I'm sure something will come into fruition where all of a sudden it will pop back up on the radar and everyone will be sharing that latest story. But uh, it's kind of business as usual on the news front, it seems. Where do you think we'll be, say, in a decade with cannabis and sport? Um, from my best of my recollection, I believe the World anti doping Agency still include – or they did include cannabis on, on prohibited list, saying it was a performance-enhancing drug. Um, but they can use it for medicine, I believe. Um, uh, do you know the rules on that, actually? I, not the specific. I have heard that there's been some acceptance around uh, cannabidiol, which uh, obviously CBD, uh, the, the non-psychoactive yep. element of cannabis, because it really does help with uh, on the rehabilitation side as far as uh, you know muscle treatment, uh, soreness, pains, et cetera. So uh, I know that's made some movement. Uh, in 10 years, you know, it's tough. I think there's different influences at different angles. We know there's some groups. Uh, you can compare the NFL to the NBA to the NHL. And, uh, you know, it seems like the, the Hockey Association is a bit more accepting than the Football Association. So it kind of varies uh, from sport to sport. And then we have the whole Olympic uh, factor as well, which obviously touches on it more so from an international perspective. But as quick as CBD is just becoming a hot topic, and it's almost like CBD 2.0. You know, we saw a lot of trend and uh, popularity with CBD specifically uh, three or four years ago. Then all of a sudden over the past year, it just got this second wind. And this time around, mainstream's really picking up on it. And I think I shared that there was actually a trade show that was down here in Southern California in Anaheim. And a few friends attended, one of them specifically Darren, who owns an MG retailer, phenomenal B2B magazine and news site. And he said, you know what, Lance, he's like so many of these companies that do 
um, rather it be, you know, some sort of, um, you know, to help with, uh, again, with the rehabilitation from any sort of injuries to uh, energy drinks to uh, supplement companies. All of them are starting to incorporate CBD as an alternative element to their lineup, to their product offering. So I think that says a lot, and it's just dizzying to hear how everywhere it's getting popular. Again, not just in North America, but throughout the world, a uh, place like Switzerland where you can purchase uh, CBD-based um, yeah, they call them cigarettes, but essentially CBD pre-rolls, uh, and they're finding that as an excellent alternative to nicotine, obviously far less addicting, still habitual, but far less addicting and somewhat healthier versus uh, nicotine with any sort of uh, fillers and chemicals that come with those. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think it'll be interesting in 10 years, and I think it'll be a lot more accepted uh, across the board. Yeah, I, I read a few weeks back that uh, an NBC Sports reported that the NFL even sort of had a, a uh, discussions about making medical marijuana permissible in the states where it was legal. Uh, but then people were fearing that that could actually wreak some havoc on free agency where some players might want to, you know, favor a team in a state where adult use or medical marijuana would be legal. And 25 of those NFL teams, by the way, would be such states. And and that there was even a, a um, you know talks about, but it won't happen yet about a full removal of cannabis off the banned substance list. And of course, because it's federal legal, that just won't happen. But it's sort of a, a roadblock anyway. I think when it when it comes to big major sports who who still seem very anti pot anti pot, where you know it's almost as if the rest of the world just isn't like that anymore. It's very interesting to, to sort of combine those two and and wonder when they're going to play catch up. I agree. I mean, that's one thing that as much as I know the U.S., uh, we've always thought of ourselves as leaders and forward thinking, especially in categories, say, around tech or the dot-com uh, space. You know, I, I think in many instances, a lot of people feel the same thing about cannabis, but yet we're the ones who very much, I think, invoke the stigma and stereotypes that are associated. You know, reefer madness, thanks to uh, former President Nixon, uh, and carried through with, uh, um, you know, the whole D.A.R.E. program and the Reagan uh, you know, that all started here in the States, as did, um, you know, the fact that Hollywood, really, again, we've talked about this before. Uh, there was just a story, an article I saw where he's saying is Pineapple Express, the last true, you know, marijuana movie before the whole movement of legalization. And it's like, wh- why should there be a, a marijuana movie? You don't watch uh, alcohol they, mm. unless it's pop- maybe about prohibition back at the turn of the century, you know? So it's one of those things where until we start treating it like the norm and start, stop making it this taboo or uh, anti or other culture conversation or topic, you know, when is it going to stop? So I agree. It's, it's something that uh, you travel to other countries and you see firsthand, I mean, going to Prague, they had uh, on-site daycare at the cannabis event that I went to there. There were families attending. There was a safe space for the children. Uh, there was not public consumption anywhere near that area. Uh, and you see that in South America. You see that in other parts of Europe. So I'm recognizing that a lot of these countries I go to where it is more the norm and it's more accepted and, and less taboo, they were never exposed as much to the reefer madness and to the D.A.R.E. program and to some of these other things that created such a stigma uh, for those of us specifically in North America. Uh, so, again, times do need to change, and, and it takes everyone participating in that to do so. Lance Lambert's hanging out with us at BovidaInc.com, your global leaders in two-way humidity control. There, there's a couple other sort of sports leagues that um, doing some research on, uh, research on is is a little bit more accepting like you're talking about. I think even the NHL, while they don't condone the use of marijuana, they don't necessarily deem it as a banned substance under its current CBA. And if players you know test positive and they don't face any type of punishment, but if league doctors sort of find like an exorbitant amount uh, of, of it within a player's body, they can sort of refer them to a mandatory substance abuse program, which I think is interesting. In the UFC, they've also actually had more lenient policies when it comes to cannabis as well. And the UFC will partner uh, with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency to test its fighters. Um, but the USADA follows the Anti-Doping Agency's code, which only sort of prohibits cannabis use within competition, but not necessarily for like the healing elements. Uh, you know, uh, if uh, if uh, athlete wants to do it for for those purposes again for medical purposes so you know i think i think we're there, a lot of the bigger leagues uh will learn from that the nfl being one of them and at the end of the day i think that as we get more education that's something that lance provides us with every week and that's one thing we're all 
getting, you know, whether it's through articles and in, in stuff like High Times or even in the Globe and Mail. Uh, you know, when it comes back to sports, what I'm getting at, Lance, is you, you really want to have player safety at, at, at the top and you want to be concerned about that and, and not limit them for, for being safe and treating themselves well. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, it's funny you bring up the UFC because that's exactly what happened uh, with Diaz and McGregor. You know, after that fight, uh, Diaz got beat up pretty bad, and there he was ripping a, a CBD oil uh, vape pen at the post-fight interview. And I think that is something that, again, UFC, uh, to your point too, hearing the same thing about NHL. The thing that comes back to as far as a challenge with this normalization is the fact that uh, this is an oil-based, not uh, uh, water-based solution. So unlike alcohol where it flushes through your system in 24 hours, uh, you know, the components of cannabinoids can stay within your system for up to 30 days. So it's just fine-tuning, measuring the nanograms as far as how much of CBD, how much of THC, how much of these cannabinoids are in your system. And as long as they're being used from a therapeutic standpoint uh, versus a purely recreational standpoint, but uh, I agree. It's just a matter of time until we get there. And it is going to happen. It's inevitable. Uh, hopefully it will happen quicker than it's been occurring. But I think uh, I think we're on track for that to, to definitely go in, in the right direction. Can, um, can CBD be water-based at all? So there are people. It's interesting. I was just talking to someone on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Case, great guy, uh, here out in Northern California, Santa Cruz, started a company called Canadips. And uh, with Canadip, it is similar, as you can imagine, to like a uh, Skull Bandit pouch that you put in your mouth. And they found a way to make um, the cannabinoids water soluble. So it is very much plausible. Mm. And that's where a lot of the studies come into play around consumption. So uh, you have that on top of Transdermals, another company I might have mentioned, a big fan, Billy and his wife out of uh, San Diego own Pure Ratio. And I've used their transdermal patches before. Uh, they're for medical first and, and for adult use second. So what I mean is they have a high CBD, low THC ratio. Uh, like I used an 18 to 1 um, patch to help with my diverticulitis. It got rid of the nausea, got rid of the stomach pains, got rid of my intestine pains. Uh, so there's things out there where it's awesome to hear the studies are going on because, again, that just reaffirm, reaffirms that this is – uh, a plant that needs to be looked at from a medical perspective as much as people look at it from a recreational perspective. So with these advancements, water-soluble uh, nanotechnology, which is kind of a played-out term a little bit, but with nanotechnology to further break it down to increase the absorption rate to 15 to 20 minutes versus 45 minutes to an hour uh, when consumed orally, those are the kind of things that are making a huge difference. And they're, they're big strides in this industry that doesn't have nearly as much support as, say, opioids in the big pharma industry where they have millions of dollars to throw at their R&D and to throw at this latest product offering. Uh, we just don't have that in this sector. Uh, so I think it, it speaks to volumes about those that are just going above and beyond to move the freedom of this plant forward and furthering the acceptance in the process. Well said, Lance Lambert, uh, bovidinc.com. Always appreciate these great, candid, open conversations. And, and again, it's all about knowledge, and you provide so much of that, as I say, week after week after week. But it never gets old, and it never gets stale, and bovidinc.com is a big reason for that. You like what I did there? Keeping it fresh! I love it. All in. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, man, we'll talk to you next week, and then I believe the week after you're in Toronto. I am. I'm looking forward to be up, and uh, we've got the date scheduled. I'll be there live, and always look forward to those, man, trying to get up once a quarter. So uh, hopefully it'll be a little bit better weather. I heard the storms have subsided, so uh, so definitely look forward to getting up to beautiful Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Mother Nature played a uh, April Fool's Day joke on us and made it freezing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lance. Okay, man, have a good evening. All right, thanks, Lance Lambert, everyone, at 805 Lance. Great conversation with them. This is the Todd Shapiro Show on Canada Talks, Sirius XM 167.